I'm Clint, and welcome to Swatches Art Livestream number 71. Now, the topics we're going to go over in this episode are all submitted by you guys. So, I had put a note out on the Facebook group and asking you guys what you wanted to see me cover in this episode, and you gave me a variety of different questions and topics to go over, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, first, we're going to take a moment to go through a couple of announcements, uh, also giving people a minute to join in here with the live chat and give me a chance to double check my settings, uh, making sure everything looks good here. Uh, if you're welcome, uh, if you're new to the channel, then welcome. I appreciate you coming by. Uh, you can see an example of it's on that side over there. Yeah. Uh, examples of some of my work, I am a working uh, professional, I do a lot of uh, freelance work for games such as Magic Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, etc. I also have a background in more traditional art with portraiture and traditional media. And we're actually going to be looking at some of my old pieces here coming up. Also, if you have any questions and you're in the live chat, feel free to drop those into the chat during the course of the episode. And I will try to get to those. Uh, do put at swatches at the beginning of your comments so that I know that they are directed to me and it will flag that in yellow for me. Much easier to see. Okay, well, everything looks good here from my streaming program. Let me go ahead and just put that up here a little bit. Hey, Kina, good to see you. Esri, how's it going? And let's jump over and open this. Sorry, I'm kind of playing puzzle game, moving all my windows around so I can see everything. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, I apologize for the camera. This is not my normal camera. I forgot that my webcam was not in the box with my other material. I had that on a different shelf. And it wasn't until about 20 minutes ago that I realized I did not have my proper webcam. So I apologize that the colors are more off and it's more distorted and everything. But hopefully I'll remember that for next time. So a couple of quick announcements. Number one, I'm starting to move into the new house. I have been putting in... A lot of hours, um, as much as I really can, up here in the new place. And I have just been cleaning and painting and fixing and putting in new appliances and hooking up the new gas heater and stove and hot water tank and all that stuff. Uh, but this room is basically livable now. And I'm starting to move some stuff in here. So yeah it's really cool uh, i've been kind of working on this house project for a couple of months i've been trying to get the house and be able to get into it for about six months now so very excited on that number two uh recording the second half of the materials course yeah i started the materials course thinking that i was going to be able to get it done in like two months it's been about six months now uh yeah the house Everything to do with the house sort of just threw my schedule out the window. And so, yeah, all the stuff is essentially made. All the examples uh, and all the slides and all that stuff that I talk through. So I'm just going through and recording the you know, 15, 20 minute uh, per day video lessons. And then I'll have to edit those down a little bit and then it'll be done already did the homework pages and stuff too uh, number three groups if you're not part of the swatches group then you can go out to swatches.group and vibrance.group and swatches has over 3,800 members right now which is pretty awesome thank you so much for being part of the community uh, it is a very supportive uh, art community uh, that is very much geared towards uh, constructive critique so we always want to give a reason why we advise somebody to do something. And do note if you post stuff out there, whether you are or are not looking for feedback or what kind of feedback or what kind of replies you'd like to see. Uh, sometimes you just want to share stuff and sometimes you are wanting to get uh, critique. So 
you know, let us know so that we can better help you. Uh, to be announced on the date for the consultations, consultations, the one-on-one -on -one video chat with me where we can go over your portfolio, your work, answer your questions, that sort of thing. We'll be able to do a lot more now that I'm getting into the house. Now, in the next probably a couple of days, basically, I'm going to be moving in here. i got to figure out why my stove isn't lighting, but largely uh, it should be able to kick off pretty soon. So I will let you know. Uh, I can't think of anything else, so I'm going ahead and pull over my page here that has the questions on it. And I'm trying to situate it off camera a little bit. <laughs> okay, let's get that out of the way. All right. Uh, Nope, now I gotta move that up because I can't see chat. <laughs> right, Ezri had asked, any chance to cover exercises on how to develop creativity? I often find myself sitting in front of a white canvas with the intention of doing something. And while I have developed an idea or concept, at that moment it feels like something is missing, that awesome element that would make it stand out. Well, a couple of thoughts on this, uh, Ezri, and I think we have all been there. We all want to be creative, and we kind of get into it, and we're like, that's just not what I'm really looking for. It, it doesn't seem to have any kind of pop to it. And so, first thought is standouts require a group to stand out from. Part of it is a numbers game. Okay. No matter how good you are, not every single piece that you do is a standout piece. Now, it might seem that way when you look at other people's portfolio or see their other work and the stuff they show. But remember, they're only showing you the good stuff. They're not showing you all of the subpar, the mediocre work that they're not super proud of. You generally show stuff that you're really proud of. So in this case, it is a number game. You try to do the best that you can, but standouts are the standouts. They're the ones that are better than all the other ones. So keep that in mind that, you you know, if you do 10 pieces, maybe you get one or two that are what you might consider exceptional, and that's okay. Uh, same thing with me. Uh, I, I don't think every piece that I do is a standout. The Let's say that your average quality is here. You know, average quality is here. And your standouts are here. There will always be a difference between the two. There will never be where all of your images are standouts. It just isn't. But you can gradually raise the bar of both of them together. Thought number two. Page from the painting process ideation. Okay, let me open that. So... If you are not familiar, I made a video on the painting process, getting the painting process, breaking it down to 10 different steps, advising you how to go through each step of the process. And there's a lot here that is worth paying attention to. Now, this is from the first stage, which is the concept or ideation stage. And this is one of the slides from that stage. So let's talk through this. When I approach it, this is kind of how I approach it, and this is how I advise, obviously, because that's what I put in my video. Starting with the end in mind. This is a big one. Having an idea of where you're trying to go will really help you get somewhere that you like being. Otherwise, you're just trying to start drawing, and then you don't really know where you're going, so it's likely that you're not going to arrive anywhere great. Number two, you don't have to know exactly what the finished image will look like, but you need to know the steps to get you there. Now, those might seem a little contradictory, but you don't have to know exactly all the details, all the stuff, but you might know, okay, I want a really great action scene that's a fantasy scene, and it's got a dragon, and it's got like these orcs coming after it. 
you know, you don't have to know every single pose of every orc and how every single light's going to work together, but you know the the anchor of what that piece is about. That's kind of the difference. And the other one is knowing the steps to get you there. Because if you follow the right steps along the way, what you're going to do is be able to maximize each one of those aspects. And that's a common mistake is where you're not making the most of each step. So when you get to the end, it isn't awesome. You only got a mediocre amount from each step. So the total is mediocre. But if you're going step by step and trying to get the most out of each one, then they all build together in the end, you have a much stronger image. So ideation, where can you come up with an idea? Where are some different things um, to get ideas from? There were a couple of questions about coming up with ideas. So this one, here we go. 10 different ideas of where to get ideas. Combine two or more unconnected subjects. So if you're not sure what to do, just try to get two unconnected things. Uh, maybe you could be a character that you get an animal and a plant or a human and a plant or a vehicle and a monster or whatever, just two unconnected things and do a concept with them together. And what that's going to do is force your brain to think of a new combination that it hasn't seen. Number two, use a concept generator. Uh, now, I kind of include that in here if you buy the thing. Uh, by this right here, I added this one here, the painting process, so you can pick it up as watches art. And <clears throat> it is basically randomizing what you're going to do. Randomizing, you know, if you're doing like a, a character, for instance, then it's going to randomize, oh, it'll be human, it'll be this class, he'll have these distinguishing markers to him. Or maybe it's a landscape and it can just auto-generate a list of things that are going to be in that scene. And then you've got to do that. Whereby you take the you take the creation ideation process out of your hands and you just do what you know something else is coming up with. Three, start with what mood or feeling you want to portray and create a word tree from that source until you have an idea. So here you could start with the word peaceful. I say, well, I want to do something that's peaceful. I well, don't know what that is visually, but then you start marking off things that are related to that. Oh, okay, I could consider music being peaceful. Water is sort of peaceful, and so you're just running off a word tree. Flowing fabric, that's peaceful. Meditating, that's peaceful. Connected to meditating is sleeping. A harp of all music seems maybe like the most pe peaceful. Uh, Water makes me think of a shrine. It can make me think of a brook. It's like, okay, shrine. Yeah, that seems kind of cool. That's what I want to do. But also, if you wanted to fill out the entire scene, then what you can do is go around and grab multiple of the subjects in that uh, group and put that into one scene. So it could be a shrine that has a large flowing fabric that comes off of it that you know, blows in the wind, or maybe the shrine slash archway is also a giant harp, and you have somebody sitting there playing this harp that's 20 feet tall. Or and maybe there's people sitting around meditating or sleeping, and this is where they come to listen to the music, and this is just where they take naps. And, you know, and already you can see this entire scene coming together. And I tell you what, it'll be kind of awesome. Well, it has the potential because... It's very cohesive. All of those elements tie to one singular element, which is peaceful. All right, next up, pick a theme. Setting parameters can help the mind be more creative. So just by limiting your subjects, it can help. So you could say a theme. Uh, it could be a mood. It could be, okay, I'm going to draw centurions, variations of centurions. That's an idea. Be inspired by your favorite art. Go out there, find some of the stuff that you've saved, and then see what ideas or what versions you could do of those sorts of scenes. Or get two of your favorite images that you've saved and see what would a meld between the two be. Next, your take on classic stories or subjects, book cover, movie poster, scenes. 
this is a really good one. This is a really good challenge. So you could get something like Alice in Wonderland, but you do your illustration of that scene and those characters. This allows you to create a new thing that's also anchored in something that people still recognize. And you can then combine that, of course, with something else. And, and, you know, I'm sure there's like Alice in Wonderland steampunk version. Well, you do whatever you want and just combine it with whatever other thing. Or maybe it's Alice in Wonderland uh, being mashed up with Wizard of Oz. And then all of a sudden you've got this combination. Okay, revisit older sketches and ideas. Uh, this is a really good place to start if you don't know where to go. Uh, just go back to some of your old sketches, uh, old characters, and things that you've done. Uh, even if they're really old, you'll remember kind of the emotion of what that was about and try to uh, build off of that. Consider a series that you could start, such as the Zodiac. You're going to paint each of the Zodiacs. You could do character classes. Uh, you know, if you're a, a fantasy game player, Maybe you do, you know, all the, all your major tropes, all right? You do your wizard, you do your barbarian, you do your swordsman, etc. Okay, number uh, nine. Consider a fictional traveler and depict what they would discover. So you uh, start doing a scene. You start doing a, a landscape scene. And you put your little traveler guy in there. And then what you do is you pick some spot in the scene and you say... My guy is going to travel, maybe it's this mountain back here. My, my little guy is going to travel to that mountain back there. And then I'm going to paint the scene again from what he sees from that location. And then you put some spot in that scene. You go, my guy is going to be down there. And what do I see from here? And so you can follow your guy around and each scene goes into the next scene. Find and join an online art challenge or competition. This is a really good one to uh, stretch, stretch your uh, abilities and it's a really good warm up for doing professional work. It is also a good way to fill out your portfolio. So yeah, uh, and that's one of the reasons we do a lot of art challenges here, which we'll be able to kick off again now that I'm getting into the house. Uh, okay, well, I think we spent a lot of time on that. Uh, no, I think that'll be it. I think we'll move over to the next one. Uh, we guess I'm just trying to see uh, if anybody else knew. Uh, Thomas, Lillian, good to see you. Uh, Giles, I assume it's Giles or Gillis. I don't know. Uh, Kayla, you're on your lunch break. Hey, well, thanks for coming by on your lunch break. Next question comes to us from Dan Robinette. And he says, I think something great to cover would be something along the lines of brush stroke efficiency, like setting intention of what you want before you start so you don't just get lost in noodling. I enjoy all your talks. I'm sure what have come up with would be great. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I'm like you, Dan. I appreciate somebody that can show some good uh, brush strokes. And, and really maximize those. So, one of the things that can be a fun challenge that I haven't done in a long time is doing brush stroke caps. Challenging yourself with brush stroke caps. Which is to say that uh, picks, uh, you know, start with something simple. Start with maybe like a rose, just a rose over, you know, a fairly solid background. And you're going to paint this rose or draw it, you know, digitally, is, I assume, is what you're talking about. And you limit how many brush strokes you can use. Say, I'm going to paint this rose in 50 brush strokes. And you start counting. And you have to really start thinking about how you're going to approach this. And how you're going to get the most out of each one. And you might start thinking about how you want your brush to, you know, follow the angle that you're going so that you can get the proper angles. Because you can't use another brush stroke to, to change it. You can't erase it, right? 
because you're just putting down color. And then you do it again, but you only use 30 brush strokes. And then you do it again and you see what you can do with 10. So this sort of thing really starts to maximize your, uh, your ability to get the most out of your brush strokes. And that can be really cool. So and that's something that's good. Uh, another thing that generally makes brush strokes not as good is having too much time. So setting a time limit can actually help. That's why um, sketches often have a lot more life to them. It's because you do them fairly quickly and you're getting a lot down with very little. And you can do the same sort of thing by setting a timer and you paint the scene in, you know, 15 minutes or, or you, you know, you paint the rose in 15 minutes and then again in 10 and then again in five. And then you see how your brain learns to condense that information uh, into a much more um, compact, uh, maximized version. Uh, uh, Michael, welcome to the challenge on the challenge of the channel. And, and you have only missed uh, two questions. So we just may get into it a little bit. All right, next up is uh, Adriano said, I'd love to hear about how to develop one's drawing from imagination and how to start doing finished works instead of studies. How to overcome the anxiety linked to that transition. Okay. Number one is, uh, we'll look at some examples here in a, in a moment. We're going to just talk through this a little bit. Gonzalo, welcome. How's it going, guys? Uh, first thing is drawing from imagination. It takes time to do well. And don't let yourself be discouraged because it's not an easy thing. Uh, not to do with a lot of stuff because you can only be building off of what you remember and people really don't remember nearly as much as they think they do visually. Uh, they don't really sit down and understand what they're observing. And that is going to have to be where you start. Absolutely understanding the fundamentals, understanding basic forms, being able to rotate basic forms, being able to understand the basic forms of the subjects that you want to draw, understanding the basic forms and volumes of the body, of a chair, of a car, all of these things. Uh, remembering the, the markers that make something unique to it. Uh, like I sat down, I was trying to draw, a, what was it, a, a squirrel from memory, and it kept looking at like a mouse, and I'm like, and, and it just really occurred to me that you know, a lot of those little guys, mice, rats, squirrels, they are very similar. Like their tails, the length of their tails, fuzziness of the tails, that is the like biggest thing that separates them. And unless I really sat down and studied it, I would have a little difficulty trying to separate them out if I was sketching from imagination. Uh, another thing I'm going to advise is go check out some videos. Uh, a while back, I did watch a video on drawing from imagination. I don't remember who did it, but I did find they had some good points. So go out on YouTube and check out videos on how to draw from imagination. And even if you just pick up a couple of good tips, then it's probably well worth your time. Uh, I'm going to show you one that I did and that I'm actually thinking about doing in the future uh, as part of the channel. Uh, let's open this up. Okay, so uh, let me zoom in here. This is a photo that I purchased in a photo pack over on photobash.org. Not a sponsor, but it's ran by a uh, fellow artist and he has a really good collection of royalty-free photos that you can purchase to use in your you know, photo bashing or reference or whatever. So I came across this little cart and I thought, oh, it's pretty cool. I, I just, I like the look of it. It's got some good little stuff going on here. 
So what I did was I drew uh, with my pen. This was traditional. So just in my little uh, sketchbook. And I, I drew this. Now, a couple of notes here. I didn't go super tight with this. I mean, this is... <laughs> this thing is maybe two inches tall in my notebook. So it's pretty little. And you also notice that I modified it a little bit. I didn't just do completely exactly everything. Um, I decided, you know, maybe he has... A, maybe it's like a little refrigerated thing on the back. And he's got a lock that he puts on there with a latch. So I, I put that on there. And I thought that back piece behind him could look neat if it had like big, you know, quilted pattern on it. And then while I was doing that, I was really having to observe what I was looking at. Because I was drawing in pen. I did not draw it in pencil first. I was just drawing it in pen. And I find that that forces me to really understand what I'm looking at. And I have to really observe the forms, the angles, the construction, all that sort of stuff. So after I did that, then I started drawing it more. And that's when I did these guys. So these are drawn without reference. This is where it gets to drawing from imagination, right? I draw one, well, possibly more. In this case, it was one. I drew one vehicle from a good reference. I really paid attention to what was uh, what the basic forms were, how the vehicle was constructed. Because if I can understand how it was made and how the pieces fit together and why they fit together, then I can change that and I can I can reuse that information and so in each one of these I just drew it again with the pen with no reference building off of the knowledge of the first one and this is a fantastic um, this is a fantastic practice and one that I frankly really enjoy and I'm going to be doing more in the future uh, so here, I'm just thinking, okay, so some of these weren't really based on that. I just, I had looked at some photos, uh, some images of Chris Foss and his spaceships. So I was drawing some spaceships on the page as well. That's not really connected to it, but, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, but like on these guys, I just, I remember what that form was. I remember how things were located. I remember the construction of the vehicle, uh, like on the back of this. Uh, I was just driving down the highway, highway and there was a truck behind me and I was looking at how the latch worked on that and so I remembered that and then I put that on there and this truck obviously has a completely different back end to it and I, when I was down in Honduras, uh, I, uh, no not Honduras, I was in, uh, hmm. Where was I? Laos. When I was over in Laos, uh, I rode in the back of a, a pickup truck that had a bed sort of like this, where it was solid up halfway, and then there was little benches in the back, and we strapped stuff to the top of it. And, yeah, and so it was drawing off of, you know, other memories of other vehicles that were similar and combining those over. And then I started trying to play around with the perspective a little bit. You know, how far can I take this? And, I, you know, I started modifying it. They didn't all stick with, like, the same headlamp. And I went on and put, like, mirrors on there and, and lights on the sides. And so I modified it, and, and I played off of that. But that is one thing that I'm going to suggest. And also to you guys, uh, I was thinking about doing just draw-along lessons. Uh, you know, just do a video where we just live stream this sort of thing. We, I'll put a photo of the subject up there and we all just draw along with our pens and I can kind of talk through some of the things to pay attention to. And then we go and we draw multiple versions of that from other angles and we, we ingrain that. See, I, I did that months and months ago, a year ago, more probably. 
And I could sit down and draw that again pretty closely. Pretty closely. It wouldn't be exact, but it would be pretty close uh, because I understood it. I understand it now. And so I could recreate it without necessarily having to look at it. And if you can just do that with enough stuff, then all of a sudden you can start putting together entire scenes where you, uh, you know, you don't need any reference for it. And it's going to be pretty close. Uh, so the idea with the series would be, you know, like once a week or so, we'd sit down and maybe we would start with like a vehicle like this. And we'd probably stay away from people because they'd get, that subject would get really complex really quickly. And it would be one of the most difficult things to do, but possibly. And then you'd learn how to do, you know, how to draw a, a fire hydrant. You know, something in their same relative size. And then you draw a scene with both of them together. And then you'd learn a third thing. And maybe the third thing is, uh, I don't know, uh, a tree. Or it could be a bench. Say that he's parked by a bench. We learn how to draw a park bench. And then we draw a scene that has all three of the things. And each time you add it into the things that you already know, therefore reinforcing it and learning how to combine the things together. And we can talk about uh, how to draw with the pen, you know, without having to sketch and how to kind of prioritize uh, the drawing process and keep it where you're trying to limit your mistakes, you know. Anyway, it's a fun subject. Let me know if that um, if that's a, a fun idea to you, and we might plan that for the future. Okay, what else? Uh, da, 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 da. Yep, that was it for Adriano's question. That was a great subject. I appreciate you uh, submitting that question. Next up is Cine. Cine says, how to design complex scenes? That's a good question as well. Uh, it is one that can seem very daunting if you don't know how to go about it because you, it's it's so easy to get overwhelmed with complex scenes. So let's take a look at some complex scenes that I went ahead and pulled together and talk through what they're doing and uh, what you can learn from that and what you can incorporate into your images. Complex scenes. Okay. Uh, I'll just take a glance down here. Uh, have I ever worked for a Games Workshop? I have not, though I do recognize the name. Uh, because some people sound like they would enjoy doing a uh, Drawing from Imagination series. So, okay, that's cool. Uh, all right. All right, so first thing, drawing complex scenes. Composition is king. If you're going to study anything, study composition because complex scenes can get out of hand and become very chaotic very quickly. And composition is what really helps tie all those things together and keeps it from just being chaotic and random. So let's go through this. Uh, uh, no, maybe not the first one. Let's start with this one. This one's a good example of composition. So there's quite a bit going on here. And if you were to have read the art brief for this, it'd be kind of complex. Like, okay, exterior scene, you're in a valley, kind of like uh, these cars to mountains, a little Yosemite, you know, going on with that scene. And then we've got uh, a couple of heroes facing at us. And there's like five other heroes that are coming down to attack them. And you're going, oh, what? What? Really? I mean, that's going to be hard. How am I even going to make that make sense? Well, look at... Okay, you know, actually, let's just open that in Photoshop. I cannot draw in uh, that program. Here we go. Oh, Navigator, a little, a little bit smaller. There we go. So... Have you noticed his composition? Yeah, radial lines. Radial lines is what he's going with here. Uh, that is not opaque enough. Okay, now let's push that to 10. So, 
He's got the lines in the ground, the radial lines coming out here. Boom, 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 like this. He's got the angle of the ground coming down. You've got her arm following that angle. You've got all of these mountains following down. You've got his spear coming down. You've got these radial lines coming down. You've got her spear following that same angle down. You've got the ground level coming in like this. Um, you've got this cloud angle coming down this way. No, it's not going that way. That would break the composition. It's not going that way. That would break the composition. No, it's coming downwards like this. Of course it is. And this, All these ground lines are coming in. And what happens? Faces. Faces direct the viewer to. Everybody is looking to the middle. This is a really easy uh, way to design a complex scene is just radiate everything from one point. And it just can hold together a lot easier than if you have people looking all different directions and you're running with front, you know, foreground, background, you know, lines and stuff going everywhere. So that would be a big one. Um, this one is actually similar uh, in that composition is really important does not use uh, the same composition at all so let's take a look at this one this one is pretty cool because it uses really great go-to option which is the triangle the pyramid boom right there now there's a lot of other things going on here yeah but that angle, and you notice that that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't random. That wasn't by accident. No, there is a reason that axe blade follows that angle. There's a reason that axe does not do this. That would not fit. No, he wants to run it right there, right over the head, and right up to that guy's head. There is a reason that this angle falls right down into her head, right by her arm, and down. That was planned. That's how you start handling complex scenes, is by arranging things to make simpler overall shapes. Now, that is uh, a couple of options. Uh, if you want to get more into composition, I have uh, an ebook on composition, and it's basically the the condensed version of what i know on composition and we'll give you go-to options patterns um, and ways of figuring out composition that'll work for your scene but let's talk about some other things complex scenes do really well <clears throat> that you need to do to do them well and this one you notice that he separates the value ranges and the saturation ranges. So nothing in the background is as uh, saturated as anything in the foreground. All the yellows, all the reds, all the cool tones are brighter in the foreground and the gold is brighter in the foreground. Everything else is dimmer in the background with the exception of the light sources themselves. Uh, the value ranges are much more limited. So if we were to do that, you can see how just this is barely sitting in the midtones, uh, separated by like one value, where this has full white to black all the way, all the values up here. And that is also an excellent way to separate it. You can also separate by color, which this is a good example. This is, uh, what's he go by? Six more vodka? I think, uh, I met him. I think I met him twice, actually. Uh, anyway, uh, he's done a lot of really great pieces for uh, comics, uh, particularly for some Marvel, Marvel Comics um, marketing pieces. And so here, obviously complex. I mean, this thing could be crazy random and, and overwhelming but it holds together why he has some simple composition going on 
and he separates things with color and value. So what you want to start thinking of is regions. Well, people might call them areas. I'm going to just call them regions. So you have the orange region only orange things up here only cool violet things down here bright reds now bright reds are your key color right bright reds can go anywhere they sprinkle throughout you got the reds here reds running up to him a little red in the fist back here little pops of red okay that's fine the reds do that uh, then the whites right and he's using uh, the whites are always in the the curve. You don't really have the uh, straight edge. So you got like a curve of white, a curve of white. So what's he doing? Repeating patterns, repeating patterns, repeating patterns, repeating patterns. Roses, repeating patterns. Face, curved white. And you see composition, built, built in, built in, built in. So he's dividing regions by shape and by color and by value right and he's adjusting it so he's you know he knows better than to put heavy oranges on the lights on these guys back here he also knows not to put more red on anybody than on the middle daredevil yeah good example okay let's close that uh, another scene here oh no photoshop Uh, a ridiculously beautiful scene that oh I'm gonna turn my screen up a little bit that looks a little dark okay so very complex scene with a lot of uh, foreground characters you got what one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen like 14 different characters and three horses and a couple of other animals and trees and stuff but it doesn't feel overwhelming it feels actually quite peaceful and look at what he's done he's got a complex scene and he's used a simple third right he's divided this scene basically in thirds where she's right along that third line and you're keeping all the brightest brights right within that area this is all shaded right so that tones them down Playing down all the values here, playing up the values here. You also, again, look at the colors. You're putting the brightest colors around the focal point, toning down the colors everywhere else. And you're also making, you know, like, even here, I mean, just like that. It's a, it's a loop, right? She's creating a loop, essentially creating a vignette around the scene like this. Um, and you also, uh, similar thing. Everybody's looking at the subject there, looking, looking. Now these are, they have their own little scene kind of playing out there. I almost feel like that for some reason was requested to be on its own. But anyway, uh, so that is some approaches that can possibly help you, uh, approach complex scenes. Um, there was one other... Oh yeah, so the same guy that did uh, this scene, these are some of his uh, sketches. <laughs> and you can see, even with the limited values, that you can get a lot out of a scene and establish a very complex scene that still reads. And this has to do with, in some of these, like these, your silhouettes. Allowing the major figures or the major actions to be visible and understandable in silhouette. So this is probably a pivotal scene. And it is allowed to stand against a, uh, a less complex, a more simple background. So that silhouette reads. Certainly over here with these two guys that are about to fall off the, uh, the edge of the parapet. And that silhouette reads really well. Also, take a look at the uh, the values. He's really only running with five values in these sketches. 
So this would all kind of go together in the shaded scene like we just saw, where the full values are going to be rocking out in this area, or at least the brightest values in the back. And then up here is going to be limited values on the dark range. The background is going to be limited values in the high range. And this is going to separate the different regions of the scene. Uh, atmospheric uh, distance is a huge thing that artists can use and use all the time in order to help separate levels in a scene. And what I'm talking about is foreground, midground, background. And that is also a big thing with doing uh, complex scenes is separating them into the different planes of the image. Uh, I do talk about this subject a bit on the uh, values episode of the Art Fundamentals here on the YouTube channel. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> uh, Nuria has says, how to come up with prompts? You are so good at it. Well, thank you. I'm glad you uh, think so. <laughs> Is there any technique I think at this point for you it's uh, second nature, but I often have no idea of what to draw. I have the intent, you know, that feeling of wanting to do, but not knowing how to direct it at something concrete. Well, honestly, going a lot back to the earlier question and going through something like this series of different ideas, you're going to come up with something out of that. But that doesn't necessarily even mean that that is what you're sticking with. It just means this is a catalyst to get you to an idea. And even then, you might want to go through several of them before you find something you really like. Uh, there are also uh, art prompt websites. All right. These are websites that you can just, um, you can Google for them, art prompt suggestions, drawing ideas, that sort of thing. And it will give you a, a sentence or some random qualities. And then you can just draw that thing and just allow it to spark your creativity going forwards. Uh, how do I do <laughs> prompts? Uh, a lot of that is just from experience. Uh, I mean, I've been doing this industry stuff for 11 years now and just done a lot of them. And I've read a lot of briefs. Um, the descriptions of scenes. So I, I guess I, I try to think of things that things that I could see uh, a client asking me to do. And another thing is picking a scene or a subject that has history to it that has a narrative to it because if you were just doing like oh give me a cool archway okay well a cool archway fine yeah we can do that but if you say okay we want an archway that is also the a giant harp that can summon you know, the spirit dragon uh that has been there for two thousand years and only the, you know, the chosen high monk can get to it and it um, has long rested on the top of this mountain. Now, all of a sudden, I've got a lore and I've got a history and I can draw from these different other ideas and I can draw from uh, what has happened to this thing in the past and I can think about the culture that it came with. So, if you want to draw just like, you know, a car... Or say that, you know, you're going to just draw a vehicle. I don't just draw the vehicle. I think about what's this vehicle used for? Who drives this vehicle? What kind of stuff do they haul? Is it a business? If it's a business, it probably has a logo on the side. If he's rich, he probably has it decked out like this. And you start thinking about the history of it can help a lot of um breathing life into a more basic concept. Okay, I think we've talked a lot about concept. We'll move on to... <clears throat> uh, the Brandon's question. He says, Keeping up with the ever-changing players in the gaming genre, 
especially the new ones. For example, Richard Garfield created artifact that kind of died on arrival due to its complexity. There seems to be three to five collectible fantasy or sci-fi themed games a year that fail. Yeah, that seems... I haven't checked the numbers, but that seems pretty right. <laughs> Does this impact the work one receives? Not really. Uh, on that line, though, uh, let me go ahead and just open this. Um, I did do three images for Artifact, so those are three that I did. Uh, <clears throat> do you recommend trying to stick with established production for known companies like Blizzard, Games Workshop, or WotC? Uh, yeah, I'm certainly nothing against them. I mean, I've worked for several of those types of companies. And they are generally good to work with. They get, generally find really good art directors who are generally also artists. And so they know how to work with artists and that makes thing, things go much smoother. And they also have the money. They're gonna come through with the payment. So that's also good. But yes, yeah, sometimes games do fail. In which case, like these are three images that I did for uh, Artifact. There's also three more images that I don't get to show you. I, <laughs> I would love to show you some of the other three that I did. I thought they were actually pretty good, but I can't because like you said, the game folded. Uh, that is something to keep in mind is that there is a possibility that you are not going to be able to show the images because the game may fold before they ever get to the point that you can even show them off to anyone. Uh, I will have to contact the company to see if I can show them even though the game kind of went defunct. Um, the problem there is like the art director I worked with isn't even there anymore so I don't know if I'll really be able to get a hold of anybody who knows. <clears throat> That being said, I don't discourage looking for work from those guys, uh, but that's just part of the industry is that sometimes things fold. Uh, I don't think it makes it a, a problem for the artist because they still need the art. And I, they, they generally need good art and the game rarely rarely falls because the art wasn't up to par. Uh, that is rarely, if ever, the the weak link in the chain. <clears throat> Man, I should have grabbed some water. My uh, throat's going a little hoarse here. Very dry air in here right now. <clears throat> Turn that heater off. <clears throat> no, so I still routinely get a request for work and if you do work with a couple of these companies then it will generally uh, make it easier to find work with other companies at least in my experience so hopefully you find that helpful if that's along the lines of what you were thinking ben asked perhaps some words on getting back into art after taking several weeks uh several week break is there a way to make learning fundamentals fun two questions uh, the, the first one, it just takes time, man. I wish I had a, <laughs> a really smashing idea for you, but I don't, and I'm right in the same boat. Uh, if I go out for a couple of days uh, and I go off on a trip or something, and I come back, or if I'm spending almost all my time in here working on the house, and then I've got to sit down and draw, it's not automatic. Uh, it really takes, it probably takes several days for me to really get back into the groove of doing it. I know when I haven't painted, like doing physical painting in a while, that it takes me multiple paintings before I really fall into the groove of how to do it properly. That was such a goofy beast. The reference they gave me, he was so goofy and cartoonish. And I just did everything I could to try to make him, because he was supposed to look like ferocious. And 
the source image just wasn't. I was telling the art director, man, I'll do what I can with it, but it is so hard to make that thing actually look fearsome because he just had like these stupid big tusks that came out and uh, and the way like the split there. To, uh, anyway, I was just thinking about that when I was looking at it. <clears throat> So uh, first thing would just be try not to work on anything critical as soon as you get back. Try to kind of warm into it. Uh, that might not always be an option, but uh, that is just one way of trying to negate how much <laughs> eventual damage you could rot by jumping in too quickly. Uh, the next stop is, is there a way to make learning fundamentals fun? I I kind of not sure how to answer that because I never really considered them unfun to begin with. Um, perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps they could be considered more fun if they were building to something. Um, as the old saying goes, it is hard to build roads that lead nowhere. Because if you don't have a destination, if there isn't some payoff for it, then it's sort of hard to motivate yourself and find it fun. So I would say, you know, pick some big subject that you want to do or some big scene that you want to do or a challenge or art challenge that you want to do. Something in this vein where your studies are all coming together in order to accomplish you doing that thing so maybe you want to do a big battle scene so your studies is okay i need to learn anatomy uh, what else do i need to learn for this scene i need to learn constructions of a catapult i need to learn uh, what armor design looks like i need to learn you know how to draw fire you know whatever is going to be in that scene so that each of your studies uh, resolves around how to accomplish this thing. So, oh, that would be one idea. Um, I, I think that might help kind of push it over and help you out a little bit. Let me know. Hmm. Da, 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 da. Where are we? Down to Justin. Okay, Justin asks, uh, not Justin, Justice. I'd like to know how you've developed a schedule or practice of learning and perfecting new skills while working full time. You've mentioned that you're primarily self-taught. True, I did not go to college or university or art school. Uh, what disciplines did you put into practice to grow your overall artistic prowess in the midst of delivering content to your clients? So yeah, I, I worked uh, for years as a graphic designer before fully uh, switching over to do uh, illustration. And a lot of that was just throwing all, you know, not all, but a lot of nights and weekends into building a portfolio. And that is where I learned a lot of stuff. Uh, I learned a lot by doing larger, more complex um, portfolio pieces than I really did from doing studies. And one of the reasons is because it forces you to combine all these different aspects. So you can study and learn how perspective works, you know, how to follow the rules of perspective. You can learn some of the things about composition. You can learn some things about anatomy. You can learn some things about color. So in each of these studies, you're learning all of these uh, you know what, let me just make sure. So you, you're learning each of these different fields, right? Uh, you know, have like color and you have perspective and you have composition and you have values and you're doing, you know, studies in each of these. But what you need eventually is a piece where all of these things have to come together. And this is something that I see people struggling with a lot. I did too, all right? I'm not saying that it's not something that you struggle with, but it's something that you have to struggle with 
and you have to get better at in order to succeed. Because it's one thing to do this, it's one thing to do this, one thing to do this, but learning how you can get this plus this plus this plus this and add all of these things together so you have this awesome end result, that's how it comes together. Um, I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> So uh, that is a lot of extra time. Uh, I would say you could start by just being very realistic with yourself and asking yourself what you're willing to give up. Uh, what are you not going to do in the evenings or on your weekends that is going to make enough time for you to do this? So I'm, I normally watch two episodes of you know, TV. I'm only going to watch one, or I'm not going to watch any, or I'm only going to watch one on Wednesday, or I normally play this many rounds of Call of Duty. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that. Or I normally work out for an hour and a half. I'm just going to do 45 minutes. So whatever it is with your life, sit down and think about what you're going to carve out to make room to do this. Uh, another thing is... Work and study are not disconnected. So I, I've received the questions all the time. How, do you, how did you do your studies while you're working? Work is study, right? Just, just because I'm not doing like little studies, every single piece that I do, I'm learning something. I'm trying to learn about how to do something in each piece. And... I try to focus on one aspect of that particular piece that I personally am trying to get better at. So for this one, I was trying to get better at um, the dapple light. I wanted a really good sense of dapple light across his face where the shadows were not lost into darkness, that you could still see everything in the shadows, but yet there was still a great... Uh, separation between the light and shadow. On this one, I was trying to get uh, the uh, intensity. So that was my main thing. And so essentially, I studied intensity while working on this piece, which is pretty cool because it's and then it's basically like your clients are paying you to improve, to study. Uh, this one, the, this one is more about just trying to make the thing not ridiculous. I ended up not trying to do great. I guess it was a little bit about painting fur. Uh, just trying to do like painting fur and how it mashes into different parts of the body and stuff. Yeah, because it has like bright green hair on the fur on the top. And then it has like the red spikes everywhere. Oh man, it was weird. Uh, so yeah, pick something about each piece. And then that's what you focus on with that piece. Uh, I'd love to see some of your graphic design work. Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. We'll see. I was, I was okay. I guess I was... I guess I was better than, you know, average, but uh, not my thing. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, yeah. Another thing, Justice. Uh, another huge thing for improving my skills while I was having my normal work, teaching. I kid you not. You want to learn something? You want to learn how to spell? <laughs> you want to learn something? Teach it. Seriously, find somebody, find some kids, find some friends, find anybody that wants to learn. You know more than somebody. Go find somebody that knows less than you and then teach them. What's going to do is force you to not just rely on your instincts. You're going to have to learn how to communicate and you're going to have to learn why you think and choose the way that you do for, you know, why you choose a color, why light behaves that way, why this, why that, how do you handle this situation? 
when you have to sit down and teach it, you really get better at it. And you also learn it to a degree where you're not going to forget it nearly as easy. And you can, you can do that in a lot of different formats. Whether you are having a class and you are having some people sitting around and you just teach them how to draw a basic still life. Uh, you teaching them about values or you actually just sit down and you put together a, a one page little um, breakdown on how to draw a nose. I, I don't know what it is, whatever it is. When you have to do that, it changes the way that you think. And it's going to make you understand things to a degree that you've never had to understand it before. So while I was working, I was teaching. I taught multiple art classes up at a, an art center nearby, nearby, an hour away. And I put together uh, numerous little exercises, feedback things online over the years. Um, I give feedback to different people that ask me over the years. So I, that was something that was always a part of it. Okay, next up. Uh, second question from Justice was, could you explain how you first got into the... I feel like I skipped something or I forgot. Sorry, my nose is really itching. Hmm. Uh, Oh, okay. No, there it is. Okay, my list. I thought if I got one of the questions, I was just double checking. Okay. Uh, Justice had a second question. Could you explain how you first got into professional illustration? Any advice on how someone would get their foot in the door with major clients? And do you have anything that you wish you would have done differently to get clients? In line with that, could you explain how you currently advertise yourself as an artist and how that has changed over the years? Okay, uh, I probably don't know as much about this as I really should, but I can tell you how I did, which is I had um, from really from about ages 13 to 18, I had uh, five good years of art education and traditional media and did all kinds of portraiture and, and traditional media, uh, oils, uh, soft pastels, uh, graphite, watercolor, pen and ink, all that stuff. And I will, uh, I'll show you some of that here in a little bit. It goes on with another question. And then I started doing graphic design and did graphic design for like eight years. And then I started switching over to illustration. Well, like I had mentioned on nights and weekends I was starting to try to put together a portfolio and after I did that I well while I was doing that of course I was updating uh, my online portfolios with my new artwork and at that time which was like 15 years ago um, deviant art was the biggest one out there and there was a precursor to art station I don't recall what it was. CG Hub was also a major one at the time. And so um, I would put some of my art out there and I picked up a, sm a smattering of, of small gigs over a couple of years when I was putting together my portfolio. Uh, nothing major, small clients just needed, you know, a custom game that they were doing or whatever. Some random book cover, whatever. Um, but... Eventually, I put together a good quality portfolio and I made a collage image and I submitted that to Wizards. Uh, I tracked down what their art uh, artist portfolio submission email addresses, their art drop email. And I did, let's see, yeah, I just submitted that JPEG in. And just said, hey, uh, you know, I'd be interested in working with you. If you take a look at my work, let me know, you know, if you're interested. And they liked it, so I started doing work with them. 
And then when those images started coming out and I could start posting those images, which was a lag of about 10 months, then I started getting offers much more regularly from other clients that it was sort of like, as soon as they saw that I was doing work from Magic, I was like, oh, okay, then we, we'll take this guy on. All right, they, he must be okay. And it sort of just, it's like it immediately gave me the clout I needed in order to get other jobs, which I really didn't have much experience. And I'm sort of surprised Wizards didn't let me go like really quickly because some of my early stuff is just really not good. <laughs> it, it's <laughs> anyway. Uh, how do you get your foot in the door? Well, I mean, one is. Pause. I think there's somebody at the door. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. I'm back. Uh, where were we? Okay, so if you were trying to get your foot in the door, then yeah, look for the art submission emails and you know start sending off your portfolio. Uh, just because you do not get contacted by the company doesn't necessarily mean they don't like your work. It's possible that they are just simply booked up with their artist and their work at that time. Another way is go to conventions, go to games conventions. And there's a lot of big conventions, especially if you're here in the US. Uh, I know they got some big ones in Europe as well. And just, you know, take your portfolio with you. We'll talk about portfolio here in a moment and take that around and just, you know, go up to the booth of whoever, you know, game studio has a booth there and just say, hey, I'm an artist. Uh, I was wondering if I could schedule a time to meet with an art director or um, you know, a game producer that might be here. And you know, just be very respectful and just see if, you know, if somebody there who is interested in uh, taking a look at artist's work or just say, you know, could I you know, leave my card with you or something like that. Uh, also at some of those big events that they will actually have art directors uh, in a certain room uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to uh, Spectrum. Spectrum uh, had it been three years ago, four years ago now, and probably four. So they had a room that had about eight different art directors, and you could just stand in line, and as an art director became available that you could just go down and sit in front of them and they would take a look at your work and give you some feedback. And if they like your work, they take your card and they maybe suggest you uh, who to go talk to. And they would kind of give you a little endorsement and say, okay, well, uh, I really like this work. This is good stuff. I think this would be good for such and such company. Uh, go over there, ask for this person and say that I sent you and that I just reviewed your portfolio. You know, something like that could happen. Uh, so that is a good option. Uh, other places get your foot in the door. Um, doing big online challenges, like um, let's see, Art Station puts on some big art challenges that gets um, a lot of eyes on it, and not just artists, but art directors, companies, all those guys are looking for that stuff. And so even though you might not win the challenge, that's not the point. The point is the publicity. There are going to be art directors and game creators who are going to just be scrolling through the entries to find stuff that they like. And that is a way to help get eyeballs on your artwork. And you might find that people start contacting you about that sort of thing. Uh, that is another idea. Um, I don't really advertise myself. Don't haven't found that I've needed to. Um, if 
I mean, the, some of the biggest things that I do is just keep your portfolio kind of up to date. Um, I, I, that's a big one. Also, I mean, you got to be putting your work out there so it can be seen. <clears throat> Try multiple sites, uh, multiple uh, multiple medias. Like, uh, post yourself on ArtStation, uh, post it on Instagram, post it on Pinterest, uh, Facebook. You know, whatever. Try a couple of different uh, platforms. That was the word I was looking for. So, yeah, uh, try a couple of different platforms. More likely that you're going to catch uh, somebody. And don't go to too many, though. Otherwise, you'll just start missing messages and, yeah, it, you won't be able to keep up. Okay, uh, Ricardo asks, uh, and I didn't write it down exactly, but he said, could we see some of your old artwork? Uh, previously, I mentioned, hey, sometime, maybe we'll just show you some of my old stuff. And uh, so it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's been about time. We'll, we can do that. So let's go ahead and close this. Uh, I'll leave that up, I guess. So <laughs> here's some old stuff. I don't have any of my really old stuff, but I do have some things. Uh, so this is a, a smattering. Most of this was between 02 and 05. So I was... 20 to 23, 20 to 23, uh, unless I uh, say otherwise. And I was just getting into digital art, didn't know much about it. And there wasn't nearly as much education out there on it back then. And yeah, well, this is actually one of my traditional pieces. This is one I did as a, I was uh, 15 at the time. <clears throat> and this is a colored pencil piece. Uh, I think I need to move it up to there. Yeah. So it's a colored pencil piece uh, that's about 14 by 24 inches or so. And I did it for a scholastic art competition for a rodeo stock show thing. Um, uh, this is, a, I, know, this is a, I had a couple of pages from an old uh, note, a sketchbook that I saved. Uh, this is fairly common, where I would draw, uh, I would draw something and then I'd redo it in notes and redo it in notes. So it's like didn't take the time to proper uh, put in proper underlying form, no expression reference, side on, very two D overall, not committed. So I drew that and I was like. Oh, I'm gonna do this really good scene, and then I just had to be very realistic with myself and like, no, it's not, and this is why. This is why it's not that good. And so it did it again. It's like, okay, we'll, we'll add more into it. We'll we'll do better. The form and proportions improved. Expression reference gives added believability. No consistent lighting, and the side on still flat overall. Decent amateur. Uh, the form is good. You notice that the slight 3D view gives depth and realism. Where this was basically just completely flat, now that we've got underneath just slightly, so we have more form going on there. Uh, water droplets add mo uh, movement, consistent underlighting creates drama, more believable, overall more professional. Uh, and you know, just drawing other stuff and working out with action and poses and random characters. Yeah. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I was just glancing at the chat. And yeah, if you have questions for me here right now with the live chat, you can just uh, put them in the live chat and I will try to get to them. Just put at swatches at the beginning of your comment. All right, this is an early, uh, probably about 2003 or so. Um, digital art. I was looking at Craig Mullen's work and have in my mind blown because he was accomplishing so much with so little of what it looked like. 
And I was trying to give the impression of this giant battle scene with, with very little actual detail. And I, I was on the right track. But I don't think I understood at the time how how much time is involved in doing some of these. Even some of these more spontaneous, uh, less detailed pieces, I needed to be willing to put more time into it. But I also didn't know necessarily how to get this and turn it into a more finished piece. Uh, I wasn't sure how to get more pop out of it. So, you know, I'm, I know what I know now because I went through a ton of images like this. Um, yeah, definitely had an anime interest back in the day. And so I've got some, some a little bit more anime. This was a, I can't remember, if it was, I think it was a pencil drawing that I scanned in. And I was playing around with digital coloring with, uh, yeah. I think the best thing about this scene is that cloud. I rather like that cloud. Very anime background with the white and the purple and the and the glow around it. Anyway. Uh, boss asked, Hey Clint, bit of a practical question. Do you or did you struggle with your posture during painting? I often find myself completely hunched over after I get lost in the painting process. Uh, yes, I do. Actually, uh, more recently, I, I was noticing my posture being pretty bad and it was just bothering my back a little bit. And I bought one of those, um, what do you call them, back braces? Uh, I don't have it with me. I'll try to bring it to the next stream if I remember. Uh, basically, it's just two loops. It's a loop that goes around each shoulder. I'm not wearing it right now, I can't show you. Uh, it goes right here and then it just makes an X and connects right there between your shoulder blades. And what it does is it pulls your shoulders back and it keeps you in a more upright, um, better posture. And I found that we're, after wearing that for most of the day, for several days, that I'm just far more aware of my posture and I generally hold a better posture even if I'm not wearing it. Uh, and they're not very much. I ordered it off Amazon for like, 12 or 15 dollars and it's just velcro it's really easy to put on take off so i would suggest go ahead and buying one of those and it's a very simple thing to do so uh I, I think it's a good investment and maybe in the future we'll cover an episode kind of about posture ergonomics yeah. let's see uh i had saw the first harry potter film uh, after that came out, and I just thought, oh, I'm going to paint Hogwarts from memory. Yeah, so <laughs> that's that's what I came up with. And this, of course, was like back in, shoot. It wasn't Photoshop CC anything. It was Photoshop, it was like Photoshop 4. I mean, it was, it was early. Um... So yeah, not not really correct, but I was trying to learn. I was trying to figure out how to do, you know, scenes like that. And, you know, being ran right up against, yeah, same thing, drawing from memory. Can't do it nearly as well as you think unless you really understand and take the time to uh, memorize what you're looking at. Uh, I was about 24. Four or so when I did this guy. Uh, he actually got sold. So I do not have the original anymore. But Soft Pastel. Uh, I love Soft Pastel. I look forward to getting back into doing um, doing more of this. Um, I, I love that it's almost a mix between painting and drawing. Because you get all the beautiful colors that you went from painting... And you can do a little mixing with it, but it's completely dry. And so you don't have to worry about any drying times or anything like that. Um, it's not necessarily a simple media to learn, but it's one that I just really enjoy. So I will probably be doing more of that. And just kind of an FYI, 
Uh, I'm going to be doing more traditional media stuff now that I moved into this house. I'm going to have enough room to have a painting studio area, basically cannibalizing the living room. And uh, we'll probably do some some streams from in there and go over some some traditional stuff. Uh, another question. Uh, Thunguns Bro says, uh, have you done animation or storyboarding work? Uh, very little. Uh, I practiced doing a little storyboarding just for myself. I was just like, read a story and kind of practiced going through it. Uh, I've done very little animation. Actually, I might be able to show you one thing if I can find it. Where is uh, OBS? Let me switch to this for a second while I try to go find that other uh, studio. Uh, where is that? Wow, I have not looked up those files in a long time. I'm trying to remember where they are. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, Okay, so, uh, oh, oh no, I need to switch screen back. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, here we go. All right. Spirited Away. Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away is one of my all-time favorite films. I have watched it many, many times and have enjoyed it every time. Uh, so, actually, when the trailer for Spirited Away came out. I was just so enthralled. I loved the music. I loved the style and the magic of it. I hadn't even seen the movie. The movie wasn't out yet. But I decided I wanted to draw, uh, recreate some of the animation from the trailer. And so uh, I did. I went frame by frame from the trailer and I redrew some of it. Window uh, timeline. So uh, what's going on here, if you're not familiar with it, is you can do some simple animations in Photoshop. And uh, I'll pull this over. So this is your layers. Each layer is essentially one frame. And you can go to Window and pull up Timeline. My timeline was already set to frame animation. I didn't have to set it that way. Uh, but otherwise, you can say uh, create frame uh, make frames from layers. Otherwise, you would, you would just have to do that. So now I have uh, each layer is added into a frame. And underneath it here, you'll see a time code. Uh, not really a time code, but it says how long to stay on each frame. So this is 0.1 seconds. I don't know if that's right or not. Uh, we'll just run it and see. So this is your go all the way back to the beginning, all the way to the end. Um, and play. So that's uh, Chiro from Spirited Away uh, jumping off of the ledge. This also kind of goes into early artwork because what, this came out in like 2001, I want to think. Spirited Away came out about then. Uh, let's set that a little bit longer. Say uh, three. Yeah, but uh, this was also really good practice. Uh, this was great for learning how to handle uh, the motion and particularly how cloth, how to animate cloth to move and paying more attention to that. And you start noticing things like how, what does the hair do when she moves? And, you know, does it go up? Does it go down? How it tries to, uh, to go around the, uh, you know, follow behind it and so yeah I just sketched these all on different pieces of paper and then I scanned them in and then I I moved them around you can see the background there <laughs> uh, where I, I had to move them around so that they kind of lined up but you can just can you tap you can't tap right okay I was thinking you could tap right to go can you tap this nope but 
yeah so I did uh, I did that that was a great little uh, example um, uh, this is another one another I decided I think I did I only did the two this is where she is um, being stubborn and does not want to go uh, and does not want to go towards the river at the beginning of the film and the dad is going off across the river to go up to the little town that he sees and she's like no and then the wind blows and it has this really howling sound and she's like oh and so she runs uh, oh yeah on this one so i was playing around with running a tween which is an in-between uh it's not exact this is just a tween that is 50 percent one layer uh, one frame and 50 percent the next frame i've seen if you know how it could work that way let's slow it down a little bit and this is another one like uh paying attention to how the the ripple in the and the shirt moves across the shirt as the wind blows and how to animate the hair that's really cool it's a great exercise i've actually thought about doing a animation a simple animation challenge like this for uh just the the group it wouldn't necessarily be a uh, a one that you buy you know a ticket challenge uh, i'm not an animator i wouldn't feel qualified critique anyone's animation but I was thinking about just maybe doing a community animation challenge where you do like a, a one second, two second clip kind of like this. Or you just find an animation that you like and you kind of just recreate it and redraw it. Yeah. So, okay. Well, that is that is my extent of animation. I've no, never done any 3D animation uh, of, of that regard, so... Okay, more old art. Let's see. Where are we at? <clears throat> uh, this is just a, a random guy with some fabulous hair. Um, still, again, early digital painting. Not really getting my hands on it. I, like everyone, was very enthralled with filters and... Um, trying to get blurring features and stuff and i couldn't find a lot of good educational videos out there i ended up spending actually quite a bit of money just buying a few courses and yeah so that's what i ended up with but you can kind of see just like you know working with the shapes working with the lighting there's a bit of things that are still kind of hallmarks of the way that I work, I suppose. But the skin's like really plasticky and it's kind of one tone and the eyes aren't developed at all. And uh, yeah, I mean, it could definitely be better. Um, just playing around with lights and scenes and like this is one of those things that this could be really kind of a cool scene. But I didn't know how to, how to do it better. Like, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you make it better? <laughs> What's your oldest work? Uh, the oldest one I probably have with me is probably it, it's going to be in that in that group. Um, I do have some old sketchbooks. But I don't think I have anything from them scanned in. We could do that someday if you're interested. Is I could. I could scan in some of the, the oldest sketchbooks I have, like some of my kiddo sketchbooks. Uh, this is where I, I was looking at work from Sparth. I think it was Sparth. I forgot what his real name is. And I was trying to do like a futuristic scene with the spaceships going through there. And uh, I was kind of over my head. But you know what? That's okay. It didn't come out the way that I wanted. 
No, it's all right. But I did give it a second shot. And so I did go look out some other ideas and I thought about the composition and this isn't making me, letting me make that any smaller. Come on. Oh my goodness, they give you like one pixel to, uh, to work with there. Yeah, so I ended up uh, tilting tilting the scene and then putting like the silhouettes of the little people down here that I would develop later, but that I never did. Uh, I got that one window and I threw that on there just to kind of give me something to work with. Um, kind of rethought my lighting and yeah, and I didn't know where to go from there though. So that's as far as it went. Hmm. Uh, I've never done, I've done, uh, my favorite Miyazaki film is Nausicaa, but no one ever knows that one. Really? Nausicaa, the Valley of the Wind? Uh, it wasn't my favorite, but yeah, I mean, I know it, I've seen it. Uh, when is the Batman one from? Are you, oh, this one? Uh, the drawing? Um. Oh, man. I don't think I'd moved away from home yet. Late teens? Mid-teens? Yeah, I would need to find the book the the notebook that that's taken out of in order to get any any more precise than mid to late teens yeah um now this is one that i feel like was actually a little more successful with the um getting more out of the brush strokes not having to be super detailed and it was basically an exercise in using two brushes so I used one major brush just to block in big shapes. That was kind of like a 100% brush uh, that had no opacity control to it. And then I was using a this really rake brush that was just a series of like eight <clears throat> um, little marks. And trying to build a scene just with those. Uh, something simple that would read well. Why that samurai is using a European sword i have no idea but he is and that's probably why i lost because you know there we go uh so i did that one and that one came out I, I was pleased at the time with it uh this is another one that i thought actually came out quite well um for a, a fairly simple scene i did that all in black and white first and then i went back and added some color to it and it's overly filtered and i didn't really know what else to do with the grass I literally just used the uh, standard old Photoshop grass brush, <laughs> which is terrible, but that's what I did. And yeah, I, see, you're always going to hit a limit when you try to do a, a workaround like that because I was trying to skip around fundamentals of design and color and value and it doesn't work that way yeah. okay uh what else uh brandon had asked at shows what is the best way to present your portfolio or basically i shortened it down to that and should you you know should you print off your pages and put them in a big portfolio and carry it with you or whatever and i'd say Honestly, if you've got a nice tablet, then that's a really good option. And it's a very popular option now with um, for reviewing somebody's portfolio. If you've got a booth and you're showcasing your artwork, then yeah, you might want to print them off and put them in a binder so people can flip through them. You wouldn't necessarily just want to leave your you know, $1,200 iPad sitting on the table for people to look at. But if you're going to an art director or a game producer uh, to look at your work, then 
yeah, a nice large iPad or, or similar uh, is a good option. And you can put your artwork in different folders so that they are geared towards the person that you're speaking to. For instance, if you're trying to reach somebody like Watsi, then you don't really need to put in concept art. That's not what you're looking for. You're, you're looking for uh, more illustration. And you're also probably not going to be putting in your traditional still life studies or your figure drawings. It doesn't have any bearing on that. Although you might want to put them in another folder. That might be exactly what you want to show somebody else. And that's one of the great things about uh, a digital portfolio on some sort of pad. Uh, another option then is to, I would say not an option, but in addition to that, make sure you have business cards. I still, I still collect them when I go to events and people still take them if I give it to them. Uh, business cards is great. Just, you know, full size. Um, I want to think that I have somebody, a good one from somebody here. Yeah, here's one from uh, Hillary Clark. Uh, met her at the Spectrum last time. You know, it's just a whole whole thing of her artwork. Really simple contact information on the back. I uh, wish I had money. I would have bought one of her pieces at the time, but I didn't. Uh, or you can do, you know, cool, like, little, little square piece. That, that, that's nice. Um, just anything like that, that the person I can actually keep with them and be able to remember what they saw from the image and be able to contact you back. Because even if they saw your stuff, they're probably going to see a lot of other stuff and they're not going to remember your name. So that's an option as well as having uh, postcards. Uh, getting a whole batch of postcards made is actually quite cheap. It's not much more than getting business cards made. And... You could put multiple images of yours on your postcard and just have those for free. You could leave that with somebody and just say, oh, would you rather have a postcard or a business card that I could leave with you? Oh, so that's an option as well. Okay, uh, another, um, and that's basically it for the portfolio at a show. Um, some sort of tablet. If you don't have a tablet, uh, borrow a tablet. Or if you can't do that, then do 8 by 10s print them off, and put them into a proper portfolio binder with the clear sleeves and just put your finished work in there have about 10 images you don't need 30 images uh, you don't necessarily want three that's a little skimpy it doesn't show you that you can do a lot of work <laughs> uh, oh yeah uh, comment saying uh, make sure the business card is uh, smaller than a credit card. Uh, well, I mean, not the standard business card is about the size of a credit card, which is fine. Uh, but the postcards obviously are larger, but you're not necessarily trying to put them in your pocket. That's so. I've yeah. uh, got another question up here. What is your favorite image you have done for MTG? Uh, I'm going to have to say I don't have one. I'm not just... Trying to skip the question, um, but you know I've done over a hundred, and I don't, I don't feel like one of them is just so much better than all the others. <laughs> there are ones that I like more than others. Um, again, I cannot open that folder without showing off other stuff. So just a second. Um, Huh. More images that <laughs> never got released. Uh, so I, I did a really nice marketing piece with some major characters uh, for MTG at one point, and art direction changed. Uh, the marketing direction changed, and it never got used. And it was a real shame because it was a, a lot of work, uh, and it would have really been nice to show. Um, you know, this is a weird piece, but uh, it it just came out recently. It's not my favorite. I'm not putting it up here because it's my favorite. I'm just 
um, kind of showing it off. Yeah, that one, uh, that was, I was about to go crazy trying to do this thing. Uh, because the, the brief, the brief was really, really open-ended. It was just like, show, show three creatures um basically having their mind erased and let it be kind of surreal and so i went through so many variations uh i want to think that i went through like and not just variations of the scene like completely different at one point i thought you know what if they were glass and what if they were like made of glass and, uh, I mean, what if they were normal, but, like, their color was draining out, and then what was left was just a glass form of the, the people? And so I did versions of that, and I just did so many kinds. And then I did this one with three of the, of the giant characters which are these things, and they were like, oh, we like the overall idea, but can we have two other races besides their giants? So I went back and made this multi-mouth, I forgot what it was, some monster, and then the, the dryad character. And, you know, and this thing is just complex, like trying to work out the three-dimensional form of if these pieces were coming off, how would that wrap around the form and how many pieces would it be? And, uh, wow. And it got complex with the layers too. Cause basically you had like a black and white layer in the background and you had like the color layer on top of that. And you're racing out of that one or painting it into the mask to reveal the black and white behind it. And yeah, but in the end I thought it was pretty successful. So it's one of those things like, is this a piece I would hang on my wall? No. Did I learn a lot? Did I get pushed a lot? Yeah, I did. So, you know, from an artistic growth point, it really worked for well. Michael asks, if I remember, you don't play MTG, but I've watched the trailers. But have you watched the trailers? They've gone from 2D animations of the cards to full 3D, and I'm curious of your opinion of that transition. Uh, you're correct. I don't play MTG. Uh, I did learn to play initially, which was like 10 years ago, but I quickly understood it wasn't really my kind of game, and I, I was not going to put the time into it to be any good at it, and remember the cards and keep up with the meta and all that, so I, I haven't played it. Um, uh, yes, uh, I have watched uh, several of the 3D trailers. I particularly remember the the trailer where they are in uh, Ravnica and the heroes are going up to fight Nicol Bolas, who took control of the uh, the Eternals and and the the Eternal and the gods from the Egyptian place, uh, Amenket. And Chandra is going up there and she's like trying to fight him and and turn the, the undead against him. But because she has a pact with him, he can kill her. So yeah, um, I thought it was cool. I mean, it got it was really well done. And I, I think it does magic well. So I, I'm, I'm completely happy with it. Um, I, I was into it. <laughs> Uh, will they mix it in the future? I think they probably will. I wouldn't be surprised if some stuff is like 2D and some stuff is 3D. Um, no, whatever they want to do. Uh, what conventions have you heard of for looking for work uh, except for Lightbox Expo? You know, I have heard of Lightbox. Um, let's see. I was just speaking with Jeff. Um... Lobenstein? Oh, forgive me if I'm not saying his right name his name correctly. <clears throat> Another magic artist, so I'm at the last magic event. And he's going to 
Origins Games convention. Uh, that would be another one to look into. Uh, it's just game makers with their booze and their games and the products they're coming out with. Uh, I was there before uh, years ago, but I think it's much bigger now. And that would be a good good choice for uh, looking around and showing your portfolio around, seeing if you can make some connections. Also see about getting onto game making uh, Facebook groups. And, and check with the moderators and check with the admins before you post. But you can put, um, and, and if they're okay with it, just say, hey, uh, I'd like to make a post uh, about art services. Uh, I'm an artist looking to get in on some new, you know, uh, game companies and their, and their IPs. And would it be okay if I could post a couple of my images and contact information? And uh, I don't know. You know how many of them would say yes out of a group, but I imagine some of them would welcome an artist making a, a, a polite post in regard to something that could help their uh, game creators. if there was uh, no I mean there's just so many magic images uh, yeah I can't pick a favorite one hmm. I think I'm proud of all the planeswalkers uh, Liliana Nissa Jace put a lot of time into each of those they came out well uh, Gisela I think came out really well and I learned some stuff with her Quit, quit opening that there. A <laughs> uh, little trouble with the windows there. Uh, Swatches, what discovery have you made that has made your art improve the most? Oh. Um. Hmm. I mean, if you're talking about way back when, I think it was just understanding depth. I mean, as a kid, learning how to start adding volume to stuff. And that was a big deal. Uh, stuff started being 3D. And I was thinking about the volumes uh, rather than just a flat shape. So that would be a big one. Um, So many little things, so many little things. Um, I would almost need to think about that. Uh, that could be a good topic to go over. Just what are some, the, the biggest kind of, you know, plateaus? Uh, what, what got me, you know, landmarks, I guess? And it's also a question, I'm sure that there is a good answer to this, but just offhand, my brain's kind of going blank. Um, how important a process is? Are you not trying to reinvent your process and just kind of stumble your way through the piece? That if you have a good process, it can really save you time and effort and make the whole thing go a lot smoother. Um, learning basic proportions so that uh, things look accurate or consistent. Um, 
Um, yeah, anyway, that's something off the top of my head. Well, we're running about two hours now, and I think we're out of questions. So if you've enjoyed this episode, I meant to say this earlier, but if you enjoy this episode, then please give it a like uh, and leave a comment. Let me know what you would like to see covered in a future episode or if there was something that stood out to you uh, in this episode that you found particularly insightful or entertaining, then let me know. Uh, leave a comment below. Uh, I would love the channel to be able to start picking back up now that I have good internet speed and I have a place to stream from consistently. And what makes the biggest difference to YouTube is people interacting with the video and telling it, hey, I like this content. I And, and it starts suggesting it to more people. So please leave a like and uh, leave a comment. Let me know. If you also like this sort of format where we just go over whatever topics you guys toss out, uh, I kind of like it because it's not just um, you know, me having to come up with something that I think you might find interesting, but I'm, I feel like I'm actually being able to address your particular concerns and questions. So if you like that, then let me know. Say, hey, yeah, this is a, this is a good way to do an episode, and in the future, could you cover this? And I will add that to the, uh, the queue. Yeah, woo, good internet. Yeah, this is the best internet I've ever had anywhere. Uh, I'm on fiber connection right now, and I can get up to uh, 300 Mbps, which is by far enough for what I'm doing. And yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll be cool. Uh, do you scan images one by one with traditional animation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I did for this, but frankly, uh, technology has improved quite a lot since then. Uh, there is a number of excellent animation programs out there. I don't really suggest using Photoshop. I think there are some inexpensive slash free programs where it will show you <clears throat> like a 50% version of the previous frame and then like a little ghost image of the frame before that and you can draw it on there anyway i watched a video of some people doing it so i, I know there's some good programs out there also on the topic of hand animated go watch the making of klaus klaus i forget how they pronounced it klaus uh netflix's 2d animated santa claus film that came out recently it looks 3d ish and a lot of that has to do with <clears throat> the way the uh the light was tracked onto the 2d forms and it's really really interesting so if you haven't gone out and watched uh the making of klaus go look it up you know just K-L-A-U-S. And that's pretty cool. Uh, also, if you like industry advancements, uh, check out the videos on the making of The Mandalorian with the virtual virtual sets where they have essentially... This is really cool. And I, the industry is going to do this. I think I shared a, a video on this on the group a while back. But essentially have like the set right and uh, then you've got the the camera here and you've got the guy with the camera and you have your actor standing here but this is all a curved screen it goes all the way around and it's like 15 feet tall and so in the camera view the camera's view is like this that it looks like they're on location because this is one seamless screen that is 180 degrees around the character. And then it's hooked up to a really powerful computer. 
and this is a 3D scene. So they can tweak stuff on their computer over here and change the lighting and change the colors and change all that or change the environment and uh, then it automatically changes on the character because they are literally being lit as if they were in that environment and then they can move this camera physically to go around this subject and this is also connected to that computer and so the background will move equal to in perspective to what this camera is doing so that it looks like it is an actual 3d set and that's one of the reasons that so many of the scenes in the mandalorian look so good i mean it looks like they're out on those locations is because they were literally standing in an environment that had those exact lighting conditions um, anyway very cool stuff so you can check that out Yep, yep, it's 8.03. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you very much for taking the time to uh, join me here on Swatches. And uh, I appreciate you coming by. Join the Facebook group if you haven't. Swatches.group, get you there. Uh, make sure that you answer the question of why you want to join the group. We have some people that are, are just automated. They're trying to sell stuff or whatever, and they don't answer the question. I don't let them in. So just leave an answer. Oh, I love art. That's fine. I'll let you in. Um, yeah. So I really enjoyed it. And we should have a stream next week. I uh, can't think of any reason why I'm not. I should be in town. But I will catch you then. Uh, yep. So until I see you next time, keep drawing.